Good afternoon and welcome to the Orkney International Science Festival and Foraging Fortnight online. The Science Festival is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year and for the first time the full programme is being broadcast live across the world on our dedicated YouTube channel. This afternoon it is my pleasure to introduce Dr Matthias Vidmar of the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh who will speak on the prospect of a Scottish spaceport in Shetland or Sutherland. Matthias, who grew up in Slovenia, studied two years of physics and philosophy at Aberdeen and completed his BSc in the former at the University of Edinburgh in 2013. He then undertook a master's in science, technology and innovation studies before embarking on a PhD specialising in the Scottish space sector. Matches now researches and teaches at the university and is co-founder of AlgaCraft, a company which analyses algae growth. This afternoon, Matches will be in conversation with Derek Harris, business operations manager at Skyrora, who have developed an orbital vehicle for the UK space industry, and Yvette Hopkins, US Army veteran and vice president of the Shetland Space Centre. Last month, the Sutherland spaceport was approved by Scottish and local government to proceed with construction. From the site near Tongue, they hope to launch the UK's first reusable orbital vehicle and following an agreement with the US, eventually host international missions by 2022. Should you have any questions for Matches and his guests, please enter them in the YouTube live chat. So, without further delay, here he is from the Edinburgh Royal Observatory, Matches Vidmar. Right, hello everyone, and thank you so much, Alistair, for this quite detailed introduction, a little bit more than I've bargained for, to be, to be fairly honest. Um, so I'm totally delighted to be joined today in this special panel um, by uh, Derek and Yvette um, and though I'm kind of based at the University of Edinburgh and my research concerns the innovation and development of space industry in Scotland um, let's by no means pretend that I'm the expert here it is the two of them who are actually both um, much more knowledgeable about, about um, the state of the art um, in the field um, as well as um, you know Having, having their hands dirty and actually uh, helping develop and build both the spaceports as well as um, rocket infrastructure. Uh, now, just a couple more words about um, Derek and Yvette before I'll do a very quick introduction into um, the space industry in Scotland, as well as um, why, do we, why do we need spaceports and micro launchers. So Skyrora, uh, where Derek is based, uh, designs, manufactures and deploys rockets to clear the way for small satellite manufacturers looking for access to space. And I'll explain in a second why that's particularly important for the Scottish space industry. They aim to support the government plans for space sector growth to the deployment of an orbital vehicle and carefully selected supply chain innovations that they believe will reinforce the industry for years to come. And that of course also would put Scotland quite at the center of the global map of small scale space industry. And similarly, Yvette, representing today the Shetland Space Center, um, um, is, is they're looking at developing infrastructure which will enable rocket launches of the kind that Derek and his team is trying to build. So Shetland Space Center is planning to build and operate at space, a spaceport in the island of Unst in Shetland, which is actually the most northerly island in the United Kingdom. The spaceport will have a diversified portfolio offering launch sites, ground stations, accommodation, as well as other opportunities such as tourism. And Yvette will explain a thing a little bit more about the site and the various plans that they're having. So critically to explain all this is really where do the spaceports fit in the Scottish space story? And those of you who've actually heard me speak at the Orkney Science Festival before, will know there's actually quite a lot of space going on in Scotland. So if you have a look at the next slide, I've actually put together a very small sort of um, summary of the key aspects of the space industry here in Scotland. What you can see is that if you start from the top right hand side corner, um, we have a lot of very kind of um, um, familiar uh, images of space 
some of which are produced in Scotland, and they are used more and more in our daily lives. Whether that is your satellite navigation or whether that is for use in agriculture, this data from space is very, very valuable. And Scotland plays a critical role in its innovation. To begin with, we have an ex extensive cluster of satellite manufacturers. Now, these are not people building huge satellites like the one sitting up um, in geostationary orbit and providing us these huge um, images of, of the Earth. These are smaller satellites which are flying a lot closer to the Earth's surface and are able to detect both a lot more detail as well as have what we call fast revisit rate, i.e. the satellites fly over the same part of the Earth's surface more often and so they can produce near real-time images of the Earth's surface. So we have loads of these being built all around Scotland and we can see, including some politicians who sort of joined those photos, we can see quite a few examples there from CubeSats built in Clyde Space to Pocket Cube um, that was uh, designed by Alba Orbital, as well as some of the systems that are built by companies such as Bright Ascension. Now, the critical part of the talk today is, of course, the launch capability. So these small satellites need to get to space one way or another. And so far, they have mainly been launched using what we call ride the share or piggybacking. That basically means a small satellite is attached to a bigger satellite being launched, and the small satellite is then sort of disassociated, sort of drops off from the big satellite after launch. However, an interesting opportunity for Scotland, which we're going to talk more about, um, is the opportunity to actually launch these satellites standalone or in small clusters, which are dedicated for, um, for, for these missions. And that would also mean, because these satellites are relatively small, that they need smaller rockets that might bring launch pads for these rockets closer to home effectively. So it's no longer going to be the case that rockets are launched in places like Florida in the US or the French Guyana in, in, in southern, uh, southern America or in, in rocket pads from Russia. But actually, they might well be launched from somewhere up north Scotland, which of course is the topic of today's conversation. We also have the other capability like the downlink, the data downlink, the satellite um, uh, downlink capability. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, the data analytics. But today, if, as we see on the next slide, we circled a big red circle around our rocket launchers and our spaceports. And in particular, the exciting field of spaceport is growing really, really fast. On the next slide, if we have a look, there's actually three different locations which are in serious contention to build um, spaceports. Um, Alistair already mentioned quite advanced plans in Sutherland. And we are really delighted to have Yvette here because she is involved in the project in the northernmost island in the UK on Unst. And it is a fantastic location. I've actually been privileged to visit it. And Yvette gave me a little tour of the site. And it is a stunning location, as well as one of the best places of anywhere in Europe to actually put small rockets into orbit. There's also another um, project um, happening in uh, North Uist, uh, in the Western Isles, Spaceport 1. And it is by no means um, a, a, a single spaceport game. In fact, as I'm sure Yvette is going to explain, we believe that the ecosystem is large enough to support multiple of these spaceports, developing um, um, a capability to launch multiple rockets um, across the, the tip of the, of the Scottish, um, Scottish main coast and, and the islands. So we are located in quite a particularly tight spot in the middle of, 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 um, of North Atlantic. Um, however, there's not that much stuff from us northwards. There is Iceland, and I think Derek might actually mention Iceland at some point. Uh, but actually, to launch small rockets into what we call this polar orbit, that is to go up across the poles and then back around the other side of the Earth and round again, actually Scotland might be one of the best places in the world to do so safely because overlooking north, there's pretty much just the North Atlantic Sea. So many, many reasons why that many spaceports are now being planned. And we'll go into details of their construction as well as the design of the rockets flying from those spaceports in just a second. Now, again, just to restress, these are relatively small rockets and their design is not entirely dissimilar to missiles that are being used for military purposes. And for that, I just have a final slide, which is people say, well, when are the rockets are going to fly from, from Scotland? And there we have some, actually, I forgot about this beautiful slide. It's got some of these sites um, up there um, on the big screen. So you can see there's the different proposals, but pretty much all of them 
revolve around a small launch complex um, and a couple of supporting infrastructure, um, as well as, of course, road access. There's a little outlier that I threw in just for uh, further discussion, perhaps, which is this bottom, um, bottom left-hand side corner picture, uh, which is the Prestwick spaceport, the only spaceport in Scotland that is potentially being talked about is an airport converted into a spaceport, where actually planes could take off with the rockets strapped underneath them um, and then launch from the North Atlantic by the rocket plane separation. It's a slightly different project and slightly further off in terms of slightly further off into the future. Uh, but in any case, loads and loads of opportunities for um, small rocket launchers in, uh, in from Scotland. Now, finally to the slide that I've, I thought is coming next, and that is that is actually the latest launch into space from Scotland. And it's not been 60 or so years ago, which is when actually the first launch to space from Scotland occurred. It's actually been happening just a few years back because small rockets have been tested in the British Isles and particularly in the Western Isles and also in sometimes um, in, the, in the Northern Isles um, since uh, after the Second World War. Unfortunately, they were mainly used for military security defense purposes, but we're looking forward now to turning these rockets to fly science missions, research, as well as commercial missions where data from space is changing people's lives in and out of every day. So speaking of rockets, I'll now segue on to Derek, who is going to tell us more about Skyrora's plans, not only to have built Scottish, entirely Scottish rockets, but also for new, more ecologically friendly um, rocket fuel, as well as other associated projects to, as he says, innovate along the whole of the value chain of rocket manufacturing. So rocket science up and Derek. Thank you very much there, much as for that kind introduction. Uh, well, if I can go to my first slide, that would be perfect. Uh, so I work for a company called Skyrora. As mentioned, we are a launch vehicle company making small launch vehicles. So I always think the term small launch vehicles is a bit as a misnamer for most people. For everyone on the street, if you talk about a rocket, you think of Cape Canaveral. If you talk about a satellite, you think of these things that are maybe about the size of the cars. But what I've got in my hand is is roughly of what the size of a very, very small satellite is nowadays. Uh, and I've got one that's a bit larger, so I do apologize. Because it's black, it's now mixing into the background uh, with that. So I'll go into my next slide. As we can see, the amount of small satellites that are now in production are greatly increased. So I, as previously stated, the fact that they, these companies had to piggyback on another company to try and get to space wasn't always convenient. Imagine that you're wanting to go somewhere, but you have to wait for someone else to go before you can get there. Uh, it would be rather annoying. So why wait for a bus to go there if you can have your own sort of dedicated taxi service? And that's why we've came along. And if we go to the next slide. So Skyrora came around and 2018, sorry, apologies, I was about to say 2019 there. Uh, and we now have sites throughout Scotland, in Bratislava and in Dnipro. On the slides below, you can see our stand, which is in Fife, being operated, which and some of our engines, which are being designed and printed and being welded in our facility just outside of Moonhead and outside of Edinburgh. We've continued to research and develop in regards to all our vehicles and to try and push ahead with any innovation. So for example, looking at the engines in the bottom right, we have started to 3D print our engines, which is something that's becoming much more popular as it allows for less welds and less parts, which hopefully then equates to less things that can go wrong. It also gives it a bit of a easier way and less scrap to be used at the time. So if you 3D print them, it is a much more economic and efficient way. On top of that, we the fuels that we use, we use a kerosene mix, which is RP1, which is commonly used within the rocket launch market. But our oxidizer goes back to British space history. And our oxidizer is hydrogen peroxide. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so with hydrogen peroxide, what happened was in the 19, 
late 1960s, early 1970s, there was a program called Black Arrow. And Black Arrow was ahead of its time. If that vehicle was around now, it would be the perfect launch vehicle for the types of satellites that Scotland is producing and that the world are really using now, so for Earth observation and things like this. So that, that vehicle didn't need something the size of a, that would take people to the moon. It needed, it was a much, much smaller vehicle, more in line with our Skylark and Skyroda XL that you can see on the screen. So because after that program, Britain really stepped away from any rocketry programs. So fr from ourselves, we had to do an incremental approach to try and bring back some of the technology and de-risk the process. So the first three vehicles you see there, I would really say fall into more of a small, very small vehicle. And these were mostly used to try and help qualify some of our electronics, but also help us build up safety procedures which haven't been in the market for many, many years. Up until our Skylark L. Skylark L is where I want to continue from. So this year we've managed to test Skylark L in the north of Scotland to do its first static tire as static fire test. So a static fire test is basically when the vehicle is ready to launch and the only thing stopping is the fact that we're controlling and holding the vehicle back. With that, if we can go to the next slide, please. Micro is down here, which is the last rocket we've actually launched. So Micro was launched, as uh, Matt Jazz was saying earlier, from Iceland just over a month ago. And th this was to allow us to test out the avionics and the trajectory analysis from this. So this was launched from the very north coast of Iceland uh, and basically gave us all the data that we require to see what can finally go into our Skylark L vehicle. If we can go to the next slide, please. So looking at the progress, we've done two launch, or sorry, three launches of Nano now, one launch of Micro, and we have the Sky High, which is a hybrid rocket. So what it means by hybrid is it uses a solid fuel and a liquid oxidizer. Uh, so it just means it has both types in there. And again, the oxidizer for that is hydrogen peroxide. So I've mentioned hydrogen peroxide a couple of times. So this may sound familiar to you because some people, maybe not myself, would dye their hair with hydrogen peroxide at a very weak level. So they can be used for blonde highlights, things like this. But if you distill this to a very, very high level, it can be used to help launch rockets in a cleaner way. So when I say cleaner, what, what hydrogen peroxide basically is, is water plus an extra oxygen molecule. So when it's superheated and goes through a catalyst, it releases the oxygen that allows the fuel to burn in space where there's no oxygen. So you have to take your oxygen with you. If we go to the next slide, please. So this Skylark L, as I said with the static test earlier, we can see here, we carried out the ground tests with this. So the vehicle is now ready to launch, uh, which is something that we are in talks with all the spaceports. I might try and put a vet on the spot for this a little bit later. We'll see what she says. Uh, but basically this is 11 meters tall and one meter in diameter. And this vehicle can reach space and is mostly going to be used for scientific experiments. So we were talking to a university professor at Edinburgh who told us for the cost of what we can produce this vehicle, we can allow 10 PhD students to prove their thesis. So it, our main aim now is to, once this vehicle is now perfected, is to try and bring that cost down so we can bring space back to the everyday person on the street, whether it be university to do projects or there's just someone using sat nav along the way. If we can go to the next So our main vehicle, XL, which is one that we'll be looking and need to launch from one of the spaceports, is a three-stage vehicle. It has 11 engines in total. Uh, so nine in the first stage, one in the second, and then in the third stage, it's a smaller engine size of 3.5 kilonewtons. The vehicle design has a few unique parts to it. So again, going back to its fuel and oxidizer, it allows for it to start and stop in a vacuum. So what that means is it can take each of the satellites it's delivering to its where it needs to go, 
drop them off, move on to the next one, instead of having to let them make their own wear there. And it allows um, us to then at the end of that, whether there's satellites to be taken out of orbit or any sort of space junk that we can take out, we can then guide our top end of the vehicle back into the Earth's atmosphere and leave no space debris. If we can go to the next page, please. In regards to cleanness and fuel, kerosene or RP1 is the normal fuel uh, for ourselves, but we've been going and pushing innovation on kerosene as well. We started to use plastic waste. So if you can just imagine being able to send a satellite in space using you, the old polystyrene boxes that pack your television or that your fridge comes in. This is the sort of thing that we're talking about. Out of recycled plastics at the moment, most of them either go to landfill or incinerated, apart from your normal day-to-day -day bottles recycling, which everyone sees. So we have managed to use a two-stage process where we go through and take the previously unrecyclable plastics and turn them into an oil, which is then distilled and blended and refined so it can be used within the rockets. And from the small charts on the table, you can see it's very similar to what the RP1 kerosene is, but we're looking to sort of push this further. We believe we could take around 400 metric tons of plastic and recycle it for launches every year using this program. If we can go to the next slide, please. One of the big things, other than the, the general ecology of our program, we look at sort of winning hearts and looking forward to the near future. So space, when you think about it, the first thing that comes to mind is NASA, is SpaceX. And the UK sort of forgotten its heritage. So at Skyroda, we really, really look to try and get involved. So during the uh, recent pandemic, we made a lot of online activities so that so kids could do, ranging from colouring books to small, easy experiments that could be done at home. We go and work with a lot of the universities, uh, train the teachers, and basically we're open to collaboration and to try and put that spark back in the space industry. Uh, there's a lot of good people out there at the moment but we're going to need more. So if we can't excite the children at the moment, all this hard work, we're going to basically run out of people to fill the job. So please, please, please have a think about what you want to do in space. If you, you might think I don't want to do space or do, do anything to do with rockets or spaceports, but maybe you want to be a lawyer. Trust me, there's only about seven space lawyers in the UK. It's a good field to get into. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So our main aims by 2030 is to be a world champion in environmental space flight. So we wanna keep pushing these innovations from 3D printing to our ecofuels with that. We, there's no point in us being able to launch satellites into space to observe, observe the earth and try and find things like the plastic islands in the oceans if we are just going to be polluting as much as we're putting up. So we find it something that we need to buy into and we need to be our core around is to have this information. We need to work towards being a cleaner industry as such. And uh, after all, 70% of the UN sustainability goals will need this data to try and achieve them. But I've went on far enough. So I, what I will do, I will let Yvette come on uh, who's, basically talk about where we need to launch from. So Yvette, over to you. Thank you, Derek. I really appreciate that. And also thank you to Matt Jazz. I work closely with both of these gentlemen and it's a real joy not only to work with them, but with uh, many of my uh, friends and uh, partners in the, uh, in the space system. We can go to the next slide, please. So Shetland. So, uh, you know, very excited to be a part of the Orkney uh, Science Festival. Uh, as you know, for my Orcadians, fellow Orcadians out there, you know, our history um, and our location is uh, inextricably linked. Um, and so many of you may actually have been up to Shetland, uh, but this, as Matt has said, um, this picture is the actual peninsula where uh, we will emplace our um, spaceport. 
So that is, as Matt just said, um, you know, the very northern island. It is a very almost, you know, by a mile, if you will, um, uh, you know, the most northern location in the United Kingdom. And because of that, uh, you know, most of you very smart folks out there will understand that the northern latitude is really important for us in terms of orbital access and insertion and the ability uh, to get to the orbits that we want to. So uh, for us, um, the Shetland Space Center has been up and running since about 2017. So about a year before uh, Derek and Sky Aurora. This, uh, there's a long history uh, in Shetland, specifically UNST, uh, and this particular location uh, as being a strategic location for military for being a crossroads uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. And you can see there, you can just sort of suss out some of the old uh, bunkers, uh, dilapidated bunkers that are there now on that particular screen. But that helps us in terms of our location. And I'll go to the next slide now, if you will. So I think, you know, I was, I was teasing Matches uh, prior to this that uh, part of the um, the lineup said, hey, you know, is it Sutherland or is it Shetland or is it Oost? You know, bottom line is um, we're all uh, in the spaceport building business. There's room enough for us with over 2000 satellites uh, and the projection uh, as um, Derek put out there, you know, the projection of the increased uh, need for decision, knowledge, information, uh, improving our everyday lives will create uh, more um, you know, launches. And so we think that our location, we know our location is, is pretty important uh, for the United Kingdom, for the Scottish ecosystem uh, and just uh, writ large in general. So what we will have is a vertical launch center in, on the island of Unst. Um, it will be for low earth orbit, uh, small sat, specifically in the polar and sun synchronous orbits. And we based this primarily in 2017, based off of a, a report that, that Matt just knows all too well, it's called the SEPTA report, which was an independently um, uh, uh, commissioned report, um, also verified by many other folks to include the British Interplanetary Society, that, that really, if we wanna get the best bang for the buck or juice for the squeeze, as I like to say, that uh, you're, you know, that Shetland is a phenomenal place uh, to build uh, a spaceport. That's, uh, yeah, so I'll just leave it at there. Okay, let's go to the next site, uh, slide. So, so let me just real, real briefly tell you about um, what our vision is and then kind of where we're at and where we're going. So it's not just a spaceport. Uh, it is really in many ways a space complex. So what we have already today is, um, is the location is an old, has an old uh, military base. So RAF Saxaford, many of you may have heard of that. Look it up. So the accommodations, for example, are already existing as part of the old commanders and officers housing that used to exist there. The launch rate, the launch, which I'll go into in a little bit, again, used to be a historical site where um, we will literally just build upon what um, our folks have done uh, previously there. The ground and data, there is a location that is just above uh, the, the launch peninsula site where we will put uh, ground station capability. Um, there's also, a, um, as I said, not accommodation, but there's an airfield that's just a couple of miles away. So it has the capability to bring in people, bring in equipment. Um, and then there's also a, a sheltered port that's also nearby. So not a deep water port, but it has about a hundred meter berthing area. So that will allow folks to also bring in um, by boat, uh, if you will, um, some of their equipment, their rockets, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really an entire complex that's there. And I would be really remiss if I didn't uh, you know, say that what makes all of that happen is the community and the people of UNST who have grown up with uh, you know, sort of a, a you know, military base. Uh, they understand you know, the logistics and the machinations of what it takes to get 
you know, operations up and running. And so they're, they're really key and critical uh, and important to all of us. What you see on this slide though, is the actual um, launch pad design. So this is on a peninsula that's actually, if you look over my shoulder, that picture um, there is, is actually a peninsula called Lambaness. And what we have uh, here, and I don't know if you can see that very well, but there's three indicative launch pads. It has room for five, but right now we're building three launch pads with two integration centers, as well as uh, part of our operations center. Um, again, I think we talked about, you know, it's a small sat, the, you know, Derek, I think is one of our folks that'll be uh, coming to us in the near future. We will also have other folks from around the world, other companies that will be coming to us. One myth, uh, one thing that I always try and talk about is debunking the myth that because we're a subarctic ar uh, archipelago, because we're so far north, because we're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, that the weather conditions must be horrible, but that's not true. Um, there are about a month, uh, two months where it uh, gets a little, uh, you know, dicey, if you will. But we have 15 years of MET data, which shows to us, uh, as well as our recent um, clients, B2 Space, who came up here and did some experiments on weather, that the weather is not as it, um, uh, that you might uh, pretend in your mind. It really is very good conditions for about 10 months out of the year, and we'll use that to our advantage. So you can see here in terms of, you know, our determined, our, or excuse me, our direct determined orbit and what our, um, our azimuth is. Uh, again, uh, it's low earth um, polar and sun synchronous, which is very helpful uh, to many companies that are out there. And our intent is to have up to about 30 launches a year not on year one, but you know, as we will continue to build up uh, up to that. The ground station uh, data, so that, you know, Matt just mentioned this, it is part of an entire ecosystem. So you, you do have, uh, for example, in Glasgow, you know, one of the best locations on the face of the planet, but certainly in Europe, to build these small sats. They are incredible and all of the R&D research that's going around it is just phenomenal. And then you just kind of punt over to Edinburgh. You know, we work closely with the University of Edinburgh where they are, they are positioning themselves to be the data-driven uh, innovation uh, location in all of Europe. That coupled with, uh, again, the manufacturing community, the business community uh, is really uh, what makes Scotland so phenomenal and unique as well as the United Kingdom. And it is an opportunity for us to, to really, you know, get beyond Black Arrow, which I think Derek uh, made mention of, and to really uh, bring all of our resources together and just get, um, you know, get this up and going. So we have um, data services, which will be uh, unique uh, to our specific spaceport compared to others. Um, and that will allow us, you, to continue to get uh, that critical data and I think, um, Matt, Jez, on your first slide, you had, uh, you know, Echometrica, phenomenal, um, you know, uh, downstream serve, data downstream services that we're working closely with. So just really uh, looking uh, forward to that. I know it's, uh, we've got a little bit more, I think we've got to go into a, a time, uh, I don't have too much time here. And I look forward to everyone's questions. But bottom line for us is we're just really excited to be a part of this uh, entire um, uh, space ecosystem here in the United Kingdom and, and more pinpointedly in Scotland. And we look forward to business. We look forward to um, you know, you, you know, folks coming up for the first launch. Uh, I know the people of Unst and the people of, um, of, uh, of Shetland really look forward to the tourism, the business, and the ability to show you uh, a little bit of our history. So with that, I will leave it there and, um, and then turn it over to Matches. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Yvette and, and Derek. So if we, um, I think, get to the final slide that sort of gets all our names again. So this is, again, an, an, an impression. Oh, there we go. Um, impression of um, the site at um, Anst. 
so thank you so much, uh, both as I say, Yvette and, and Derek, for, for fascinating and very detailed presentations. Uh, we did receive quite a few questions, um, and we probably won't have enough time uh, to answer them all, but we'll try and record them and, and perhaps uh, answer them uh, sort of offline or rather in different online venues if, if possible. By the way, if you do have any more uh, questions, do pop them into the YouTube chat uh, that's below the video if you're viewing this on uh, YouTube. Um, so looking at the questions, um, I think there's a couple of sort of themes emerging. Um, one, one interesting concern that I think since we still have that picture of the um, outline of the, of the site at uh, UNST uh, in our mind, um, I think there's an interesting question here about sort of environmentalism and preservation of that um, environment on the site. Um, one interesting observation, of course, is there's a sort of exclusion zone in terms of access to the site um, that I've heard not just in this case, but in case of other spaceports as well, is actually potentially beneficial to the preservation of wildlife because it, it makes these spaces somewhat less accessible by humans and that the frequency of launches and all the infrastructure of development on these sites is actually significantly lower than it is if you just, you know, people just wander about and, 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 and disturb the environment. So I know that um, Spaceport One, for instance, Western Isles, they're talking about kind of creating a, a nature reserve there. I think we've, we've had some similar plans and I've, I've been in touch with some groups that also look towards protection of the dark skies and other things. So maybe a couple of comments as to environmental footprint of spaceports, perhaps, Yvette, if that's possible. Yeah, absolutely. I probably should have covered that. But no, just like Derek said, and I think everyone uh, is talking about the sustainability and the importance of keeping um, you know, our, our areas and everything that we're doing um, pristine. So um, I'll, I'll just a real quickly, you know, when people think about Cape Canaveral, you know, most people don't know that that's a bird sanctuary uh, and that there's, you know, there's, you can actually have both coexist. When we say 30 launches a year, for example, what we're really talking about is, you know, each launch there's about two minutes that really disturb from a noise perspective. And even then, you know, the noise levels are not what you would expect. So, uh, you, you know, that ability to, if you think about it in those terms, we really are coinciding side by side. Another thing, you know, where our launch site uh, will be is where, um, you know, I shouldn't call them out by name, but uh, Charlie and the Unst uh, common grazing you know, those folks, that will be when we're not launching, you know, that's, that's, that's common grazing area. And so we've, we've worked with them to say, hey, when we launch, um, you know, we need you guys to, to move, launch, come back. Uh, and that's, you know, ultimately, that's how we're going to do business. Uh, like I said, the people of Unst have been incredibly, you know, open arms for us to help us figure through all these problem sets. The other thing too that we've got in mind obviously is, um, so let's think about uh, the data aspects. And when we have a data analytics center, you know, there's, that generates so much heat. Well, we're gonna take that heat and we're gonna reuse it, you know, back into other locations so that that is just not, you know, dissipated and, and lost. Um, the fact that we are a little bit, you know, uh, you know, in the Northern hemisphere and it's a little bit cold up there, you know, that uh, enables us so we don't have to, when you think about data analytics centers, you're always uh, trying to cool them down, cool them down. We don't need to do that. We've got fresh seawater, we've got a cool environment, it's pretty stable. So, so that also cuts down on um, the type, uh, the, the amount of energy. There's one other thing and then I'll, I'll close out. Um, there's a phenomenal uh, company that we work with uh, called Pure Energy that that really does a fabulous job of, um, uh, they specifically uh, produce hydrogen, uh, but they use a lot, they use that to, um, to, uh, to green, if you will, uh, a lot of the um, people, products uh, and locations that they work in. So we're working very closely hand in hand with them. And so our expectation is uh, that they will continue to, to help us green our spaceport. Does that answer your question, uh, Matches? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's really comprehensive and, and quite detailed. And um, and to continue with the environment theme, the other kind of obvious um, impact, of course, is a rocket body that lands somewhere in the middle of Atlantic. But I think, Derek, you have some plans to actually um, recover them and, and possibly even reuse them. Is that right? 
certainly. It's a very, very early stage with that. Uh, I think what you need to think of, Elon Musk makes it look so, so easy to, for, to relaunch and to catch all of them. Part of the reason that we're looking at sort of Inconel printed engines is the fact that the Inconel is used in the deep sea um, for the oil and gas at the moment. So after we launch Skylark L, that will give us a chance to review structure, composites and engines to see what feasibly can be reused and what can. At the moment, we have an idea of what we might be able to reuse. Uh, but until you actually have that first proper launch, uh, which we're hoping for pretty soon, it's still only a guideline and an idea. But yeah, certainly I know with all the governments involved and all the spaceports involved, there is a discussion about protecting the marine life and such. So everyone is really looking to try and keep it as clean and green as possible. Can I just interrupt real briefly on this, Matt? Please. Yeah, so we, uh, and I think Derek knows this, um, we had a, you know, there's not only just, um, you know, rockets that are going up, but there's balloons or, um, you know, other things that are that are going to be going up. So we had a recent, uh, I mentioned B2 Space earlier, we did a, a launch with them. And the part of what we did, obviously, was to test our, uh, the ability to retrieve, to do uh, basic recovery. Uh, so that's one of the things we're doing with not only seafaring, but taking a hard look at that, been working extremely closely with Marine Scotland. And so we're now licensed, uh, you know, from a navigational risk assessment to do that. And then our own, um, we've been working very closely with the college here in Shetland, UHI and NAFC, uh, with the idea of potentially using the merchant marine and uh, you know the cadets that are there as also a potential um, you know training environment for them. Excellent, brilliant. So um, there's tons of questions coming in, and 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 we are kind of running against time a little. I'll explain a couple of things. I think some people are a bit confused. For instance, what Leo is? That's low Earth orbit. That's basically where these small satellites will sit, which is somewhere between. Um, 150 to 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface, depending on who you talk to, they'll give a slightly different answer to exact uh, details. But basically, the satellites that are flying the lowest um, in the um, uh, above the Earth's atmosphere. And um, there's also uh, questions like, if Scotland is such a great place to build rockets and to launch them to space, why hasn't this really been done before? And I think the answer here, I'll, I'll try and do very quickly, and I hope you two will just nod, um, is that you know it's been a little bit of a mixed bag, right? It's it's on one hand. Um, it's potentially partially because of the way the space industry has developed in, in the UK. Derek mentioned there was actually a, a native space program that was pretty much scrapped in the 1960s. So that capability moved overseas, was part of the Ariane con, um, 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 group that's now part of Airbus that's still launching. I mean, in fact, that British technology hasn't been completely lost. It is part of the um, Vega launchers and the, and the um, Ariane program launches, which are bigger rockets flying off from French Guiana. Um, and also in terms of what space industry has been doing, right? Been building big satellites. And for those big launches, Scotland is not a good place because you do want to launch them close to the equator. So it's only in the past 10, 15 years or so where the smaller satellites have come online that we have an actual opportunity to get them into orbit. And once you have those satellites, then you can look at locations like the ones around, around Scotland. So just maybe a couple of a couple of, of a couple of little ones. Final final questions. I suppose this is for both of you, um, and I can I can I'll rephrase it. I apologize for the person who posted it. I'll, I'll rephrase it slightly. So like, what do you think is the biggest asset for Scottish space industry in terms of space sports? Right. I mean, the suggestions were community, geography, or our sites, existing infrastructure. But you know, in one word, which one do you think is the best, or or is there a way to is there a way to combine all three into one? Vivek, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. So there is no way to answer that in one word. Um, but what I would tell you is this, they're in many ways all equally important. So for us at Shetland, our geographic location, our positioning is critically important, right? But we could not, would not ever think about doing it without the full support, full throated support of our community, of our local authorities, of my fellow 
uh, you know, uh, brothers and sisters in the Scottish ecosystem. And that includes the, you know, the manufacturers, the local businesses, the Sky Roras, the, you know, the Matt Jazzes, Orkney sites. I mean, it's, it's really, and I can't stress this enough, it's an entire team effort. It's an entire ecosystem. And so the answer is, I was getting ready to type, type the response. The answer is the most valuable asset, community geography or sites is yes. It, yes, they're all critically important. It's all part of an ecosystem. Sorry, took too long. <laughs> uh, very similar. Uh, I would say people, people make the industry for us, whether it's the scientists, the staff, the communities, people are what's going to make Scotland push and be the leading edge of the space industry. Well, thank you both. And back on to Alistair. Sorry for taking slightly longer than we've promised, or I promised. No problem. That was a fascinating presentation from all three of you. Uh, thank you to Matthias, Yvette, Derek, and our audience at home. I'd also like to thank the technical team, uh, Swain, Kathy, Reiner, Freya, and also uh, Science Festival organizer, Kathleen Hogarth. Our next talk today will be at 3.30 p.m. Join us then to hear Dennis Davidson and Len Wilson talk about the boats for the bay. There are also some spaces available for our P.D. Kirk lunches this week and our evening festival club. If you would like to relax around one of our virtual tables and meet some of the festival speakers, do register and join us for the lunches. You can find the links in the description below each PD Kirk lunch event and on the festival's website. We'd also like to invite you to the festival club tonight and are sharing the link in the live chat now. Please do subscribe to the Orkney Science Festival YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. Thanks once again and goodbye.